Chapter 2 of Operation Terror by Murray Leinster, read by Mark Nelson. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Operation Terror, Chapter 2 The car was ordinary enough. It was one of those scaled-down vehicles which burn less fuel and offer less comfort than the so-called standard models. For fuel economy, too, its speed had been lowered, but Lockley sent it up the brand-new highway as fast as it would go. Now the highway followed a broad valley with a meadow-like floor. Now it seemed to pick its way between cliffs, and on occasion it ran over a concrete bridge spanning some swiftly flowing stream. At least once it went through a cut which might as well have been a tunnel, and the crackling noise of its motor echoed back from stony walls on either side. He did not see another vehicle for a long way. Deer he saw twice. Over and over again coveys of small birds rocketed up from beside the road and dived to cover after he had passed. Once he saw movement out of the corner of his eye and looked automatically to see what it was, but saw nothing. Which meant that it was probably a mountain lion, blending perfectly with its background as it watched the car. At the end of five miles he saw a motor truck, empty, trundling away from Boulder Lake and the construction camp toward the outer world. The two vehicles passed, combining to make a momentary roaring noise at their nearest. The truck was not in a hurry. It simply lumbered along with loose objects in its cargo space rattling and bumping loudly. Its driver and his helper plainly knew nothing of untoward events behind them. They had probably stopped somewhere to have a leisurely morning snack with the truck waiting for them at the roadside. Lockley went on ten miles more. He begrudged the distances added by curves in the road. He tended to fume when his underpowered car noticeably slowed up on grades, and especially the long ones. He saw a bear halfway up a hillside pause in its exploitation of a berry patch to watch the car go by below it. He saw more deer. Once a smaller animal, probably a coyote, dived into a patch of brushwood and stayed hidden as long as the car remained in sight. More miles of empty highway, and then a long straight stretch of road, and he suddenly saw vehicles coming around the curve at the end of it. They were not in line, single lane, as traffic usually is on a curve. Both lanes were filled. The road was blocked by motor-driven traffic heading away from the lake, and not at a steady pace, but in headlong flight. It roared on toward Lockley, big trucks and little ones, passenger cars in between them, a few motorcyclists catching up from the rear by riding on the road's shoulders. They were closely packed as if by some freak the lead had been taken by great trucks incapable of the road speed of those behind them, yet with the frantic rearmost cars unable to pass. There was a humming and roaring of motors that filled the air. They plunged toward Lockley's miniature roadster. Truck horns blared. Lockley got off the highway and onto the right-hand shoulder. He stopped. The crowded mass of rushing vehicles roared up to him and went past. They were more remarkable than he'd believed. They were dirt-mover trucks. There were truck and trailer combinations. There are sedans and dump trucks, and even a convertible or two, and then more trucks, even tank trucks, and more sedans and half-tonners, a complete and motley collection of every kind of gasoline-driven vehicle that could be driven on a highway and used on a construction project. And every one was crowded with men. Trailer trucks had their body doors open and they were packed with the workmen of the construction camp near Boulder Lake. The sedans were jammed with passengers. Dirt-mover trucks had men holding fast to handholds, and there were men in the backs of the dump trucks. The racing traffic filled the highway from edge to edge. It rushed past, giving off a deafening roar and clouds of gasoline fumes. They were gone, the solid mass of them at any rate. But now there came older cars, no less crowded, and then more spacious cars, not crowded so much and less frantically pushing at those ahead. But even these cars passed each other recklessly.
there seemed to be an instant hysterical fear of being last. One car swung off to its left. There were five men in it. It braked and stopped on the shoulder close to Lockley's car. The driver shouted above the din of passing motors, "'You don't want to go up there. Everybody's ordered out. Everybody get away from Boulder Lake. When you get the chance, turn around and get the hell away!' He watched for a chance to get back on the road, having delivered his warning. Lockley got out of his car and went over. "'You're talking about the thing that came down from the sky,' he said grimly. There was a girl up at the camp, Jill Holmes, writing a piece about building the National Park, getting information about the job. Did anybody get her away?" The man who'd warned him continued to watch for a reasonable gap in the flood of racing cars. They weren't crowded now as they had been, but it was still impossible to start in low and get back in the stream of vehicles without an almost certain crash. Then he turned his head back, staring at Lockley. Hell! Somebody told me to check on her. I was routing men out and loading them on whatever came by. I forgot." A man in the back of the sedan said, "'She hadn't left when we did. I saw her. But I thought she had a ride all set.' The man at the wheel said furiously, "'She hasn't passed us, unless she's in one of these.' Lockley set his teeth. He watched each oncoming car intently. A girl among these fugitives would have been put with the driver in the cab of a truck, and he'd have seen a woman in any of the private cars. "'If I don't see her go by,' he said grimly, "'I'll go up to the camp and see if she's still there.' The man in the driver's seat looked relieved. "'If she's left behind, it's her fault. If you hunt for her, make it fast, and be plenty careful. Keep to the camp and stay away from the lake. There was a hell of an explosion over there this morning. Three men went to see what had happened. They didn't come back. Two more went after them, and something hit them on the way. They smelled something worse than skunk. Then they were paralyzed, like they had hold of a high-tension line. They saw crazy colors and heard crazy sounds, and they couldn't move a finger. Their car ditched. In a while they came out of it, and they came back, fast. They just got back when we got short-wave orders for everybody to clear out. If you look for that girl, be careful. If she's still there, you get her out quick." Then he said sharply, "'Here's a chance for us to get going. Move out of the way.' There was a gap in the now diminishing spate of cars. The driver of the stopped car drove furiously onto the highway. He shifted gears and accelerated at the top of his car's power. Another car behind him braked and barely avoided a crash while blowing its horn furiously. Then the traffic went on. But it was lessening now. It was mostly private cars, owned by the workmen. Suddenly there were no cars coming down the long, straight stretch of road. Lockley got back on the highway and resumed his rush toward the spot the others fled from. He heard behind him the diminishing rumble and roar of the fugitive motors. He jammed his own accelerator down to the floor and plunged on. There'd been an explosion by the lake, the man who'd warned him said. That checked. Three men went to see what had happened. That was reasonable. They didn't come back. Considering what Vale had reported, it was almost inevitable. Then two other men went to find out what happened to the first three, that was news. A smell that was worse than skunk. Paralysis in a moving car, which ditched. Remaining paralyzed while seeing crazy colors and hearing crazy sounds. Lockley could not even guess at an explanation. But the men had remained paralyzed for some time, and then the sensations lifted. They had fled back to the construction camp evidently fearing that the paralysis might return. Their narrative must have been hair-raising, because when orders had come for the evacuation of the camp they had been obeyed with a promptitude suggesting panic. But apparently nothing else had happened. The first three men were still missing, or at least there had been no mention of their return. They'd either been killed or taken captive, judging by Vale's account and obvious experience. 
He was either killed or captured, too, but it still seemed strange that Lockley had heard so much of that struggle via a tight beam microwave transmitter that needed to be accurately aimed. Vale had been captured or killed. The three other men missing probably had undergone the same fate. The two others had been made helpless, but not murdered or taken prisoner. They'd simply been held until when they were released they'd flee. The car went over a bridge and rounded a curve. Here a deep cut had been made and the road ran through it. It came out upon undulating ground where many curves were necessary. Another car came, plunging after the others. In the next ten miles there were, perhaps, a dozen more. They had been hard to start, perhaps, so left later than the rest. Jill wasn't in any of them. There was one car traveling slowly, making thumping noises. Its driver made the best time he could, following the others. Sober common sense pointed out that Vale's account was fully verified. There'd been a landing of non-human creatures in a ship from outer space. The killing or capture of the first three men to investigate a gigantic explosion was natural enough. The alien occupants of a spaceship would want to study the inhabitants of the world they'd landed on. The mere paralysis and release of two others could be explained on the theory that the creatures who'd come to Earth were satisfied with three specimens of the local intelligent race to study. They had Vale, too. They weren't trying to conceal their arrival, though it would have been impossible anyhow. But it was plausible enough that they'd taken measures to become informed about the world they landed on, and when they considered that they knew enough, they'd taken the action they felt was desirable. All of which was perfectly rational. But there was another possibility. The other possible explanation was, considering everything, more probable and it seemed to offer even more appalling prospects. He drove on. Jill Holmes. He'd seen her four times. She was engaged to Vale. It seemed extremely likely that she hadn't left the camp with the workman. If Lockley hadn't been obsessed with her, he'd have tried to make sure she was left behind before he tried to find her. If she was still at the camp, she was in a dangerous situation. There'd been no other car from the camp for a long way now. But there came a sharp curve ahead. Lockley drove into it. There was a roar and a car came from the opposite direction, veering away from the road's edge. It sideswiped the little car Lockley drove. The smaller car bucked violently and spun crazily around. It went crashing into a clump of saplings and came to a stop with a smashed windshield and crumpled fenders but the motor was still running. Lockley had braked by instinct. The other car raced away without pausing. Lockley sat still for a moment, stunned by the suddenness of the mishap. Then he raged. He got out of the car. Because of its small size, he thought he might be able to get it back on the road with saplings for levers. But the job would take hours, and he was irrationally convinced that Jill had been left behind in the construction camp. He was perhaps five miles from Boulder Lake itself, and about the same distance from the camp. It would take less time to go to the camp on foot than to try to get the car on the road. Time was of the essence, and whoever or whatever the occupants of the landed ship might be, they'd know what a road was for. They'd sight an intruder in a car on a road long before they'd detect a man on foot who was not on a highway, and was taking some pains to pass unseen. He started out, unarmed and on foot. He was headed for the near neighborhood of the thing Vale had described as coming from the sky. It seemed to him that his best pace was only a crawl, and he desperately needed all the speed he could muster. He headed directly across country for the camp. All the world seemed unaware that anything out of the ordinary was in progress. Birds sang, and insects chirped, and breezes blew, and foliage waved languidly. Now and again a rabbit popped out of sight of the moving figure of the man. But there were no sounds or sights or indications of anything untoward where Lockley moved. He reflected that he was on his way to search for a girl he barely knew, and whom he couldn't be sure needed his help anyway. 
Outside in the world there were places where things were not so tranquil. By this time there were already troops in motion in long trains of personnel carrying trucks. There were mobile-guided missile detachments moving at top speed across state lines and along the express highway systems. Every military plane in the coastal area was aloft, kept fueled by tanker planes to be ready for any sort of offensive or defensive action that might be called for. The shortwave instructions to the construction camp had become known, and all the world knew that Boulder Lake National Park had been evacuated to avoid contact with non-human aliens. The aliens were reported to have hunted men down and killed them for sport. They were reported to have paralysis beams, death beams, and poison gas. They were described as indescribable, and described in artists' conceptions on television and in the newspapers. They appeared, according to circumstances, to resemble lizards or slugs. They were portrayed as carnivorous birds and octopods. The artists took full advantage of their temporarily greater importance than cameramen. They pictured these diverse aliens in their one known aggressive action of trailing Vale down and carrying him away. This was said to be for vivisection. None of the artists' ideas were even faintly plausible biologically. The creatures were even portrayed as turning heat rays upon humans, who dramatically burst into steam as the beam struck them. Obviously, there were also artists' conceptions of women being seized by the creatures from outer space. There was only one woman known to be in the construction camp, but that inconvenient fact didn't bother the artists. The United States went into a mild panic. But most people stayed on their jobs and followed their normal routine, and the trains ran on time. The public in the United States had become used to newspaper and broadcast scares. They were unconsciously relegated to the same category as horror movies, which some day might come true, but not yet. This particular news story seemed more frightening than most, but still it was taken more or less as shuddery entertainment. So most of the United States shivered with a certain amount of relish as ever new and ever more imaginative accounts appeared describing the landing of intelligent monsters, and waited to see if it was really true. The truth was that most of America didn't actually believe it. It was like a Russian threat. It could happen, and it might happen, but it hadn't happened so far to the United States. An official announcement helped to guide public opinion in this safe channel. The Defense Department released a bulletin. An object had fallen from space into Boulder Lake, Colorado. It was apparently a large meteorite. When reported by radar before its landing, defense authorities had seized the opportunity to use it for a test of emergency response to a grave alarm. They had used it to trigger a training program and test of defensive measures made ready against other possible enemies. After the meteorite landed, the defense measures were continued as a more complete test of the nation's fighting forces' responsive ability. The object and its landing, however, were being investigated. Lockley tramped up hillsides and scrambled down steep slopes with many boulders scattered here and there. He moved through a landscape in which nothing seemed to depart from the normal. The sun shone. The cloud cover, broken some time since, was dissipating and now a good two-thirds of the sky was wholly clear. The sounds of the wilderness went on all around him. But presently he came to a partly graded new road, cutting across his way. A bulldozer stood abandoned on it, brand new and in perfect order with the smell of gasoline and oil about it. He followed the gash in the forest it had begun. It led toward the camp. He came to a place where blasting had been in progress. The equipment for blasting remained, but there was nobody in sight. Half a mile from this spot, Lockley looked down upon the camp. There were Quonset huts and prefabricated structures. There were streets of clay and wires from one building to another. There was a long, low, open shed with long tables under its roof. 
a mess shed. Next to it metal pipes pierced another roof, and wavering columns of heated air rose from those pipes. There was a building which would be a commissary. There was every kind of structure needed for a small city, though all were temporary. And there was no movement, no sound, no sign of life, except the hot air rising from the mess kitchen stovepipes. Lockley went down into the camp. All was silence. All was lifeless. He looked unhappily about him. There would be no point, of course, in looking into the dormitories, but he made his way to the mess shed. Some heavy earthenware plates and coffee cups, soiled, remained on the table. There were a few flies. Not many. In the mess kitchen there was grayish smoke and the reek of scorched and ruined food. The stove still burned. Lockley saw the blue flame of bottled gas. He went on. The door of the commissary was open. Everything men might want to buy in such a place waited for purchasers, but there was no one to buy or sell. The stillness and desolation of the place resulted from less than an hour's abandonment. But somehow it was impossible to call out loudly for Jill. Lockley was appalled by the feeling of emptiness in such bright sunshine. It was shocking. Men hadn't moved out of the camp. They simply left it, with every article of use dropped and abandoned. Nothing at all had been removed. And there was no sign of Jill. It occurred to Lockley that she'd have waited for Vale at the camp, because assuredly his first thought should have been for her safety. Yes, she'd have waited for Vale to rescue her. But Vale was either dead or a captive of the creatures that had been in the object from the sky. He wouldn't be looking after Jill. Lockley found himself straining his eyes at the mountain from which flank Vale had been prepared to measure the baseline between his post and Lockley's. That vantage point could not be seen from here, but Lockley looked for a small figure that might be Jill, climbing valiantly to warn Vale of the events he'd known before anyone else. Then Lockley heard a very small sound. It was faint, with an irregular rhythm in it. It had the cadence of speech. His pulse leaped suddenly. There was the mast for the shortwave set by which the camp had kept in touch with the outer world. Lockley sprinted for the building under it. His footsteps sounded loudly in the silent camp, and they drowned out the sound he was heading for. He stopped at the open door. He heard Jill's voice saying anxiously, But I'm sure he'd have come to make certain I was safe. A pause. There's no one else left, and I want— Another pause. But he was up on the mountainside. At least a helicopter could. Lockley called. Jill! He heard a gasp. Then she said unsteadily, Someone just called. Wait a moment. She came to the door. At sight of Lockley, her face fell. I came to make sure you were all right, he said awkwardly. Are you talking to outside? Yes. Do you know anything about— I'm afraid I do, said Lockley. Right now, the important thing is to get you out of here. I'll tell them we're starting, all right? She stood aside. He went up to the shortwave set, which looked much like an ordinary telephone, but was connected to a box with dials and switches. There was a miniature pocket radio, a transistor radio, on top of the shortwave cabinet. Lockley picked up the shortwave microphone. He identified himself. He said he'd come to make sure of Jill's safety, and that he'd been passed by the rushing mass of cars and trucks that had evacuated everybody else. Then he said, I've got a car about four miles away. It's in a ditch, but I can probably get it out. It'll be a lot safer for Miss Holmes if you send a helicopter there to pick her up. The reply was somehow military in tone. It sounded like a civilian being authoritative about something he knew nothing about. Lockley said, Over, in a dry tone, and put down the microphone. He picked up the pocket radio and put it in his pocket. It might be useful. They say to try to make it out in my car, 
he told Jill wryly. As civilians, I suppose they haven't any helicopters they can give orders to. But it probably makes sense. If there are some queer creatures around, there's no point in stirring them up with a flying contraption banging around near their landing place. Not before we're ready to take real action. Come along, I've got to get you away from here." But I'm waiting! She looked distressed. He wanted me to leave yesterday. We almost quarreled about it. He'll surely come to make sure I'm safe. I'm afraid I have bad news, said Lockley. Then he described, as gently as he could, his last talk with Vale. It was the one which ended with squeaks and strugglings transmitted by the communicator, and then the smashing of the communicator itself. He didn't mention the puzzling fact that the communicator had stayed perfectly aimed while it was picked up and squeaked at and destroyed. He had no explanation for it. What he did have to tell was bad enough. She went deathly pale, searching his face as he told her. But, but, she swallowed, he might have been hurt and not killed. He might be alive and in need of help. If there are creatures from somewhere else, they may not realize that he could be unconscious and not dead. He'd make sure about me. I, I'll go up and make sure about him. Lockley hesitated. It's not likely, he said carefully, that he was left there injured. But if you feel that somebody has to make sure, I'll do it. For one thing, I can climb faster. My car is ditched back yonder. You go and wait by it. At least it's farther from the lake and you should be safer there. I'll make sure about Vale." He explained in detail how she could find the car. Up this hillside to a slash through the forest for a highway. Due south from an abandoned bulldozer. Keep out of sight, never show against a skyline." She swallowed again. Then she said, "'If he needs help, you could do more than I can. But I'll wait there where the woods begin. I can hide if I need to, and I might be of some use.' He realized that she deluded herself with the hope that he, Lockley, might bring an injured veil down the mountainside, and that she could be useful then. He led her. He went through the camp with her to put her on the right track. He gave her the pocket radio so she could listen for news. When she went out of sight in brushwood, he turned back toward the mountain on which Vail had occupied an observation post. It was actually a million-year-old crater wall that he climbed presently. And he took a considerable chance. As he climbed, for some time he moved in plain view. If the crew of the ship in Boulder Lake were watching, they'd see him rather than Jill. If they took action, it would be against him and not Jill. Somehow he felt better equipped to defend himself than Jill would be. He climbed. Again the world was completely normal, commonplace. There were mountain peaks on every hand. Some had been volcanoes originally, some had not. With each five hundred feet of climbing he could see still more mountains. The sky was cloudless now. He climbed a thousand feet, two, three. He could see between peaks for a full thirty miles to the spot where he'd been at daybreak. But he was making his ascent on the back flank of this particular mountain. He could not see Boulder Lake from there. On the other hand, no creature at Boulder Lake should be able to see him. Only an exploring party which might otherwise sight Jill would be apt to detect him, a slowly moving speck against a mountainside. He reached the level at which Vale's post had been assigned. He moved carefully and cautiously around intervening masses of stone. The wind blew past him, making humming noises in his ears. Once he dislodged a small stone and it went bouncing and clattering down the slope he'd climbed. He saw where Vale could have been as he watched something come down from the sky. He found Vale's sleeping bag and the ashes of his campfire. Here too was the communicator. It had been smashed by a huge stone lifted and dropped upon it, but before that it had been moved. 
It was not in place on the benchmark from which it could measure inches in a distance of scores of miles. There was no other sign of what apparently happened here. The ashes of the fire were undisturbed. Vale's sleeping bag looked as if it had not been slept in, as if it had only been spread out for the night before. Lockley went over the rock shelf inch by inch. No red stains which might be blood, nothing. No. In a patch of soft earth between two stones there was a hoof-print. It was not a footprint. A hoof had made it, but not a horse's hoof, nor a burrow's. It wasn't a mountain sheep track. It was not the track of any animal known on earth. But it was here. Lockley found himself wondering absurdly if the creature that had made it would squeak, or if it would roar. They seemed equally unlikely. He looked cautiously down at the lake, which was almost half a mile below him. The water was utterly blue. It reflected only the crater wall and the landscape beyond the area where the volcanic cliffs had fallen. Nothing moved. There was no visible apparatus set up on the shore, as Vale had said. But something had happened down in the lake. Trees by the water's edge were bent and broken. Masses of brushwood had been crushed and torn away. Limbs were broken down tens of yards from the water and there were gullies to be seen wherever there was soft earth. An enormous wave had flung itself against the nearly circular boundary of the lake. It had struck like a tidal wave dozens of feet high in an inland body of water. It was extremely convincing evidence that something huge and heavy had hurtled down from the sky. But Lockley saw no movement nor any other novelty in this wilderness. He heard nothing that was not an entirely normal sound. But then he smelled something. It was a horrible, somehow reptilian odor. It was the stench of jungle, dead and rotting. It was much, much worse than the smell of a skunk. He moved to fling himself into flight. Then light blinded him. Closing his eyelids did not shut it out. There were all colors, intolerably vivid, and they flashed in revolving combinations and forms which succeeded each other in fractions of seconds. He could see nothing but this light. Then there came sound. It was raucous. It was cacophonic. It was an utterly unorganized tumult in which musical notes and discords and bellowings and shriekings were combined so as to be unbearable. And then came pure horror as he found that he could not move. Every inch of his body had turned rigid, as it became filled with anguish. He felt, all over, as if he were holding a charged wire. He knew that he fell stiffly where he stood. He was blinded by light and deafened by sound, and his nostrils were filled with the nauseating fetter of jungle and decay. These sensations lasted for what seemed years. Then all the sensations ended abruptly. But he still could not see. His eyes were still dazzled by the lights that closing his eyelids had not changed. He still could not hear. He'd been deafened by the sounds that had dazed and numbed him. He moved and he knew it, but he could not feel anything. His hands and body felt numb. Then he sensed that the positions of his arms and legs were changed. He struggled, blind and deaf and without feeling anywhere. He knew that he was confined. His arms were fastened somehow so that he could not move them. And then gradually, very gradually, his senses returned. He heard squeakings. At first they were faint, as the exhausted nerve ends in his ears only began to regain their function. He began to regain the sense of touch, though he felt only furriness everywhere else. He was raised up. It seemed to him that claws, rather than fingers, grasped him. He stood erect, swaying. His sense of balance had been lost without his realizing it. It came back very slowly. But he saw nothing. Claw-like hands, or hand-like claws, pulled at him. He felt himself turned and pushed, 
He staggered. He took steps out of the way to stay erect. The pushings and pullings continued. He found himself urged somewhere. He realized that his arms were useless because they were wrapped with something like cord or rope. Stumbling, he responded to the urging. There was nothing else to do. He found himself descending. He was being led somewhere which could only be downward. He was guided, not gently, but not brutally either. He waited for sight to return to him. It did not come. It was then he realized that he could not see because he was blindfolded. There were whistling squeaks very near him. He began helplessly to descend the mountain, surrounded and guided and sometimes pulled by unseen creatures. End of chapter 2